All right, we'll get underway. Good evening, everyone, and, um, and welcome to PNP Live. I'm uh, Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And we have with us this evening a very experienced journalist, Jackie Combs, uh, to talk about her insightful, richly detailed new book, Dissent, The Radicalization of the Republican Party and Its Capture of the Court. A couple of brief housekeeping notes first, though. Uh, to post a question at any point, just uh, click on the Q&A uh, icon at the bottom of the screen. And in the chat column, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of Dissent. Jackie has had a, a long and accomplished career in journalism, stretching back more than 40 years. Her first reporting jobs were in Texas, beginning in the late 1970s with the Abilene Reporter News. Then she wrote for a chain of 14 state uh, papers, and then she worked for the Dallas Morning News, where she covered state government and politics from Austin. 1984, she moved to Washington and joined Congressional Quarterly. Six years later, in 1990, she shifted to the Wall Street Journal's Washington Bureau, uh, where she spent time on the Congressional and White House beats and eventually became the paper's chief political correspondent. In 2008, she jumped to the Washington Bureau of the New York Times, uh, serving there variously as a White House correspondent, national political, uh, politics reporter, and chief economic correspondent. In recent years, she's been White House editor for the Los Angeles Times, and later this month, she'll become a Washington-based columnist for the LA Times. So you can see uh, Jackie's had a lot of experience reporting on US politics over the years and draws on that experience, as well as much additional research in her new book. She takes the story of Brett Kavanaugh's life, career, and ascent to a seat on the Supreme Court and puts it in the larger context of the Republican Party's shift to the right over the past four decades, particularly the determined campaign by conservatives to dominate the American government's judicial branch. An NPR uh, review of uh, Jackie's book called it a remarkable work of reportage, saying Jackie writes elegantly, but without adornment, resisting the urge to editorialize or make grand pronouncements. And Kirkus uh, commended the book as a well-written, a deeply informed account uh, of the long battle to steer the Supreme Court rightward. Uh, Jackie will be in conversation with another veteran journalist, Karen Tumulty, uh, whose Washington Post columns are no doubt familiar to many of you. Uh, in previous in in incarnations uh, during her long career, Karen has served as a national political correspondent for the Washington Post. Uh, and before that, she reported for Time Magazine and the Los Angeles Times. And earlier this year, Karen's own excellent book was published, The Triumph of Nancy Reagan, revealing a nuanced biography of the former first lady. So uh, 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 Jackie and Karen, the screen is yours. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Brad. And thank you all of you for, for joining us on this Friday evening. I don't know if you can tell, but we're only semi-virtual. Actually, Jackie and I are together in politics and prose, <laughs> which also has the virtue of we can go out to dinner after this. But I am absolutely delighted to be here discussing her excellent new book that you can pick up a signed copy right here at Politics and Prose. And what I wanted to start out at sort of a high altitude here, Jackie, because you come to this project, as, as Brad noted, with the perspective of someone who has been in Washington, observed it, reported on it, analyzed it from the Reagan era. And really, you have the perspective of someone who has seen the entire evolution of the Republican Party right. from Reagan to Newt Gingrich through the good year to do through <laughs> the Tea Party movement. Right. I mean, have you seen, and of course, one of the biggest projects of the conservative movement during all of this time was to reshape the courts. So how 
did that perspective really shape your approach to this project? Well, I had been thinking of a book for some time uh, in recent years because it be had become obvious um, that the biggest story of my career, our careers, was this transformation of the Republican Party. And it's a sign where things have come that when I really started thinking about this book, I felt it was too edgy to refer to the radicalization of the Republican Party, but now it just seems like it's just a given. It's, I don't think there's a better word. But what I, um, so I had seen this uh, uh, change that I saw, I felt like I had covered four revolutions, starting with Reagan, where he really solidified the Republican Party for the conservative, its conservative base after years in which the more moderate mainstream had controlled. And then segued to Newt Gingrich. Um, and you saw that the sort of sunny optimism that Ronald Reagan brought to, to conservatism was um, taken over by this uh, style of Newt's that he himself summarized as be nasty. And it coincided with the rise of conservative media talk show hosts and in 1996, uh, Fox News. And so the two fed off of each other and um, gave rise to this uh, sort of uh, very conservative, militantly conservative uh, base of the Republican Party that by the aughts, by the turn of the new century, you had this phenomenon of this bottom up um, uh, movement of the, the voters themselves um, who had been, you know, fed this steady, steady meal of uh, red meat from the talk shows and um, and these the groups, the well-heeled groups that um, rich conservative donors had uh, given to to make it seem like grassroots, but the astroturf groups that um, would would really uh, propel these uh, conservative militancy forward at the grassroots level, and then you know, gave way to Trump, who, who didn't create the MAGA army. He sort of harnessed what was there from the Tea Party and um, uh, further radicalized it, further gave it license to be uh, racist, bigoted, um, nativist. And so now where it goes is, is anyone's guess, but Trump or no, it will continue in the direction we are and see it right now. And so anyway, I was doing this thinking in terms of the Republican Party and um, was too busy to really put down my thoughts in a book proposal. And then came the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearing and sort of serendipity accident, my agent and my um, uh, editor who, with whom I'd been speaking about this re Republican book came to me and wanted a book on Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation. I knew there were gonna be several other books in the works and I decided to, we just talk and we married the two ideas because when you look at Brett Kavanaugh's life, you see somebody who's a virtual zealot like character for the perfect Republican man. I think Karen, yeah, you, you I, told me. Yeah, it, it strikes me the, the early part of the book as you are tracing his own journey through this shifting landscape that if, if you were to manufacture <laughs> a, a Supreme Court candidate in a laboratory right. for the <laughs> conservative movement, it would be Brett Kavanaugh. Yeah, Petri dish of Brett. <laughs> um, and and what, what we mean by that is you look at his life and he um, you know, grew up in within the Beltway, as we say, in Washington. And he, uh, from a son of a Republican father, and he ended up at Yale Law just a couple years after the birth of the Federalist Society there, which had you know, by the t as he got older, had he joined right away. I mean, it was clear to conservatives on the make that you know the Federalist Society was going to be something, and it it what became something beyond its founders' wildest dreams. Uh, it's a virtually institutionalized network for identifying conservative lawyers and effectively vetting them. Uh, so that now we see it. I mean, every there's a six-three Supreme Court now. No better evidence of the influence of the. Federalist Society than that all six of the Republican um, nominated justices are or were members of the Federalist Society. But anyway, so he did that. He did the Federalist Society at Yale. He did, you know, Ken Starr, yeah, clerkships with very conservative, well-known 
judges, uh, internship with Ken Starr, and then transferred on to Ken Starr's uh, investigation of Bill Clinton for nearly four years. And then on some of the, he was a lawyer for some of these culture war issues late in the century, and then worked on Bush v. Gore. And from there, it was an easy path into the Bush White House, where he was at the center of some of the biggest controversies of the Bush administration until he, including judicial nomination fights, and he himself became at the center of one of those fights when Bush nominated him for the DC Appeals Court, second most prestigious court in the federal judiciary. And it took him three years to get confirmed. And um, it was controversial enough that some of those controversies would arise again in his 2018 confirmation ahead of the sexual assault allegations. So you use the word revolution. There have been four revolutions. Mm -hmm. uh, these were more than just about the tone. Could you describe what, what these four revolutions were and what specifically they were at the different points rebelling against? Well, the, the Reagan revolution, like I said, was a, um, the culmination of what had been a decades long fight within the Republican party, um, especially going back to World War II, but even before. Um, and the conservatives um, want, were a, a more militant. They wanted to be uh, harder edged um, against, they were you know, against the New Deal programs long after most Republicans, you know, starting with Dwight Eisenhower had given up. And, and Ronald Reagan was one of them. And yet he put a, you know, he approached it with a smile and it, and it was long said into his presidency that he, people um, liked his style more than the substance of his presidency. Um, but it was uh, a far more conservative politics, but it still was true to some of the foundational matters of the Republican Party, like free trade and pro-immigration um, and things that they, and, and an internationalism that is now some all but missing from the Republican Party. And then when Gingrich came along, it was, um, there was a desire to be more militant still. They, they, in many ways, saw Ronald Reagan as too pragmatic and, um, they were much more doctrinaire, but it was not even about ideas so much as, as much as Newt Gingrich would like to say, I think. Um, but it was, uh, it was a more stylistic and it was more geared towards culture war issues as opposed to economic. Now, you know, for instance, uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, abortion, anti-abortion um, politics was a big part of his campaign, but he never did anything about it. He, talk the good game, but the by the 90s and Newt Gingrich, again, they were promising things, but they were more willing to do it. But mainly it was about the fight. And um, and a, just a sense they were, be, it was the beginning of what we came to fruition with um, Donald Trump is that there was, they were picking on the grievances of the white, even more than had ever happened before of, of white working class Americans. Um, and the, the Tea Party was an extension of that. They were rebelling against the fact that even the Gingrich Republicans, once they came to power, had seemed too pragmatic. They had become the establishment. And part of the, one of the reasons they become the establishment is because when you're in power, as you know, we covered it, you have to do certain things. You have to raise the debt limit. You have to pass a budget every year. And their voters were so, radicalized to demand a balanced budget, defund Planned Parenthood, um, that they, uh, and defund all sorts of uh, social programs that they couldn't understand why the Republicans couldn't force this. Um, and uh, then that gave, you know, Trump came along and he harnessed that. And um, which is why then you have a president who was a revolution against the Republican establishment, but without any ideas behind it. Except Brett Kavanaugh would very much seem to be a product of that establishment. Yes. He grows up in Washington, he goes to a prep school, 
Yes, he was in conservative politics, but it was at Yale. Um, so did he undergo an evolution as well while he is making this journey? I mean, at some point, does he shrug off the, the establishment himself? I don't know that he ever, I wouldn't say he shrugged off the establishment. The, the journey he took is when he began from Yale on, he was a part, he was eyeing what was um, thought of a conservative legal movement. And, you know, if you're in the conservative legal movement, you join the Federalist Society. You, um, uh, he worked for a two very conservative appeals court judges and then from them was able to get in with Anthony Kennedy on the Supreme Court. And, uh, but it was when he then joined, um, he never really went into private practice. It was interesting. It was clear that that was not where he saw himself. He saw himself, he, the path he saw to a uh, judgeship in the Republican party was more political. And when he, uh, Ken Starr brought him on to the Clinton investigation, most people would think that could be a career killer potentially because it was such a partisan role, but instead it so proved his bona fides to the right that it was seen as a good thing. But the evolution that happened to him, I think when he did that is over those three or four years, he became so, um, he became a partisan. He became a political actor and he took on a hate of the Clintons that we would hear echoed in 2018 when he had his um, rant uh, on at this uh, Senate Judiciary Committee hearing in which he talked about the uh, revenge of the Clintons in his angry tirade before, this, before the uh, committee that in any past era would have been a disqualifying performance. So Ron Brownstein, now of the Atlantic and CNN, my, my former colleague at the Los Angeles Times refers to this book as the confirmation hearing that Brett Kavanaugh never had. I mean, what did you come up with that they didn't? And in your assessment, what what did the confirmation process do right and what did it do wrong? I can't honestly think of anything it did right, Karen. Um, it was, uh, I think um, what I have here is actually nothing in here that should have been, that wasn't available or wouldn't have been available to the Senate if they had done the sort of honest um, confirmation hearing uh, that they should have that is would be appropriate for giving a you know 53 year old 54 year old man a lifetime seat on the Supreme Court. Um, there were people that there were two phases to the Brett Kavanaugh confirmation hearing. The first was right after Labor Day 2018, and this is before the sexual assault allegations came up. And I remember watching those hearings and at my desk at work and watching everything I could watch in my spare time between editing. And I was, I was sort of blown away. I only vaguely knew of Brett Kavanaugh. This was before I had any idea I was going to be writing a book about him. And I was just so persuaded by the evidence that the Democratic senators marshaled that suggested he had been um, dishonest in his answers to them during his two previous confirmation hearings for the DC Court of Appeals that I thought on that grounds alone, he should not have been confirmed. There were things that he had, they had what they had in 2018, what I have in the book it, in, um, in a comprehensive form that didn't get much attention during his confirmation hearing are emails that the Senate didn't have in 2004 and 2006 in, from his time in the Bush White House that show that he had played a role in a number of the controversies involving, you know, warrantless surveillance during the Bush years, um, the detention and torture of terrorist suspects, uh, some of the most controversial judicial nominations of the Bush years, in which he said had testified earlier under oath he had nothing to do with. And these emails 
proved otherwise. And so, and there was also in that time, one of the things he testified to that I think is perhaps the most damning thing at all of all. And you may remember, I remember it from covering Congress in 2003. It's obscure now, but it's really important, uh, was a scandal involving the theft of thousands of Senate Democrats emails by a Republican staffer. And it wasn't clear until 20, it, Brett, Brett Kavanaugh testified under oath in 2004 and 2006 that he did not have any idea, you know, where they came from and had no reason to suspect there was anything untoward. Um, and he just didn't know anything about them. By 2018, there were these emails proving he did. Not only that, but he was in some on some occasions, the only recipient of those emails from this Republican staffer who had basically hacked into the Demo Senate Democrats email system. And it was just, um, and then in 2018, he went from saying he had no idea about any of these, uh, any of these emails that were stolen to saying, oh yeah, I did, but it was standard operating procedure. That's the way Democratic, Democratic and Republican staffers all the time share information. Did you ever know a um, Republican and Democratic staffer to share a 4,000 page memo from a Democratic staffer to her boss, Senator Pat Leahy? I mean, it was just on its face. It, the, the Senate Democrats knew they were being lied to, but he got through anyway. And that doesn't even get us to the sexual assault allegations. And that's of course what everybody remembers those okay. hearings for, first of all, Christine Blasey Ford. Was she telling the truth? I have no idea. I, I, I do it. I have no doubt that Christine Ford and Debbie Ramirez are telling the truth. And one of the other things, I, I mean, everyone's familiar with the Christine Ford story, although what they're not familiar with because of this sham of a confirmation hearing and investigation is that there was some corroboration. She had had she, there were sworn statements that got no attention from not just her husband, but from three good friends swearing under penalty of perjury that in for years past, going back to 2002, she had told them about the teenage assault and she had either described it as being the work of, she named him to her husband and therapist Brett Kavanaugh, or she said a Washington lawyer who's now, who worked for Bush and is now a federal judge. Um, and Debbie Ramirez, her, she was, the Republicans were able to just bury her story. And just to, to show one thing, there is a, there are two people who tried to, so Debbie Ramirez's story didn't come out until after, a week after Christine Ford's and the Republicans were ramming this through so fast, they were able to, it, it's just remarkable, they were able to keep a lid on it so that it didn't suggest a pattern of behavior on his part. And one of the reasons they were is because the third allegation came up that people hear about Jen, from a woman named Julie Swetnick and it was less credible. Now, I, I, I'm not sure. There yeah, that one was kind of yeah, yeah, and she just, and I'm not sure uh, that was, Credible. There may have been truth there, but um, it wasn't. It, it, but it was the, the Republicans definitely conflated her story, which was less, less credible, with the other two women who were credible. And Debbie Rears, I was going to say the one thing there were two Yale classmates, guys who did not even know who she was, who had come to the FBI and the Senate Judiciary Committee in July of 2018, right after he was nominated and told this story that they had seen, that they had heard about in real time that Brett Kavanaugh had exposed himself to one of their classmates. And they didn't know who she was, but they described it all exactly that there had been a dildo waved around and then a real penis in this woman's face and that Brett Kavanaugh was the person who exposed himself. They couldn't get through, the FBI didn't respond, the, the Senate, um, Judiciary Committee um, did not act on it. And um, there you have it there. But then, so the, what we see of Brett Kavanaugh's temperament as 
all of this is unfooling. Mm -hmm. What does that say to you, going back to your initial assessment of whether he should be yeah. on the court? Well, I think the, it doesn't even matter what I think, the, the performance on September 27th, which was the memorable day that first Christine Blasey Ford, and then he separately testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee, both of them for three, four hours apiece. It was an angry performance that um, was in keeping with his um, reputation for uh, uh, being belligerent when he was drunk, but here he wasn't drunk. This was a performance um, that he was encouraged to give by Orrin Hatch, senior Republican on the Judiciary Committee, as well as Don McGahn, the White House counsel. Um, and uh, he went in loaded for bear and delivered. It was disqual, it wasn't just the, the um, justice, the retired justice, John Paul Stevens changed his mind about Brett Kavanaugh after that. He said that the Senate should uh, not, uh, perhaps not confirm him. The American Bar Association was reconsidering its um, recommendation for him and um, a no, and the uh, number of a great number of law school deans and professors uh, wrote including the dean of the Yale Law School um, so it was but it didn't matter because it was just as similar to Clarence Thomas in 1991 when he you know referred to the um, high-tech lynching and played the race card in his confirmation hearing. This was um, when you have politics that are this tribal, the Republicans um, were not gonna peel off as long as Donald Trump did not peel off. And Donald Trump did not because he had a good record of it. If a man was charged with some sort of sexual misconduct, uh, birds of a feather flocked together and um, Donald Trump was behind his man. So, Brett Kavanaugh, now on the court, we've had a few years to see what kind of justice he is. Trump gets another appointment to the Supreme Court, Amy Coney Barrett. We have just come out of mm -hmm. a Supreme Court term. We are looking at one this fall in which they are going to be dealing with right. some huge cases, uh, including involving abortion, involving gun rights. The conservatives have their majority. What has that meant and what is it going to mean going forward? I think it's still a work in progress. One of the uh, uh, interesting things in a way sort of frustrating is a lot of the commentary coming out of this most recent um, Supreme Court term was that it was um, that the the uh, the fears of the left and the hopes of the right neither one will, will realize that this court even with a 6-3 conservative majority was more pragmatic uh, more moderate looked for sort of compromise rulings um, to the great chagrin of the right but also Sam Alito uh, one of the justices who would frequently complain in his dissents, even in his concurrences, about what they had, um, about what the conservative majority had done. One thing, both in Brett Kavanaugh's case and in the conservative uh, majority writ large, you're seeing far more. Um, a, a couple things stand out. Uh, they real. The project is to um, advance the idea of religious liberties, which is primarily for Christian conservatives. Um, this is, after all, the court that um, upheld eventually a ban against Muslims um, uh, coming into the country uh, or people from uh, majority Muslim countries. But um, for conserv whether uh, religious liberties, even at the expense of discriminating um, against like gay uh, gay rights against voting rights. And you saw a lot of that in the 
Um, one of the reasons the court term is sort of seen as pragmatic is because it doesn't take into consideration all these cases that are called the shadow docket. They were emergency uh, orders in the past months because of the pandemic in which um, the uh, Christian groups, religious groups, Catholic groups would appeal the decisions of states and local governments who had put up restrictions, including on churches because of the pandemic and the conservative groups appealed these. And the, um, once Amy Coney Barrett was on the court, it became a 5-4 ruling for the religious groups. When Ruth Bader Ginsburg was still on the court, it was five to four the other way um, because John Roberts had, um, had deferred, he was willing to be deferential to the state and local governments. And the other one is in the voting rights. The pandemic, there were two sorts of cases that just brought a lot of emergency order um, actions before the court. And the other was voting rights, again, because of the pandemic. And in all of those cases, um, Democratic groups, voting rights groups lost every time, which is why- well, Especially right at the end. Yeah, and right at the end then you had, so there was all this talk about what a sort of generally pragmatic, the court's not that far right. And then on the very last day of the term, no coincidence there, two six to three cases, one which um, essentially um, gutted or you know greatly weakened the last um, uh, meaningful provision of the 1965 Voting Rights Act and another that would um, raise the specter that uh, disclosure of contributions, including campaign contributions, might be a thing of the past. And um, and these are sort of countervailing because one is deferential to right. the states and yeah. the other one rolls over right. California. Right. And the other thing that was interesting was that in one in the case in which they the Republican appointees upheld Arizona's Republican controlled Arizona's laws, res, uh, restrictions on voting, Alito, Justice Alito wrote that opinion, and he went on at great length justifying these or saying states and, uh, were justified in doing this because of voting fraud, of which there's vanishingly little evidence. And, um, and he cited none. And so he based this opinion on the fact that they were, with, that the state and local governments were within their rights to take these, to restrict voting, access to voting, because of the threat of fraud. But then in the California case on dis, uh, against its law requiring disclosure of contributions to a conservative group, um, they said that the, the state argued, California argued, that the, the law was intended to, the disclosure to the state only, not to the general public, was so that the state could determine whether these groups were brought were for real or whether they were fraudulent and that California residents might be hurt as a result. In that case, the court said, well, you, you showed us no, there's no evidence that you ever used that to ferret out fraud. There was fraud. And they, they just rode right over that um, argument in that case. So it just was a it was so highly inconsistent that it was sort of a surprise that it came out that way on the same day. So what do you think going forward? Like I said, we've got this, right. we have especially, you know, gigantic right. abortion case, gigantic gun case coming yes. up in the next term. Well, that's the thing. That's where, again, the six to three conservative majority um, showed its effect. They've agreed to take up these two cases in particular. One is a, a Mississippi um, law that bans abortion after 15 weeks, which is the idea that the, the court, it's, it's just a sort of astounding that the court's even taking this up because it's so patently unconstitutional. If you just go on the um, long history of the court's rulings and precedents since Roe versus Wade, which said that uh, women had a constitutional right to an abortion up to the point of, of viability in their pregnancy. Well, there's, you know, 15 weeks gestation isn't viability by anybody's um, measure. Um, and then this gun case they took, there hasn't, uh, and partly this is John Roberts trying to, one of the ways in which he's trying to ward off really controversial cases that will put the court 
may, are on the wrong side of where the American public is. And most of the American public, you wouldn't know it by our gun laws, but most of the American public is for greater gun controls. Anyway, with the now a 6-3 court, he was no longer able to control the agenda and they have agreed to take up a gun case uh, that for expanding gun rights in the next term for the first time in a decade. So that and other things will make for a potentially blockbuster term. Um, on the other hand, we still have a chief justice and sometimes in alliance with Brett Kavanaugh and even Amy Coney Barrett, where they are trying to sort of split the baby in a way that isn't like, for instance, just to be uh, a downright um, overturning Roe versus Wade because they want to sort of stay, you know, not, you know, not, not make the uh, court be seen as just as polar, just as partisan as our other two branches of government. Well, we do want to have some time here for questions from our audience. So what I'm going to do now is throw it back to Brad Graham, and we would like to invite you to, um, if you have any questions for Jackie, to go ahead and uh, put them in the Q&A. By, by now, you know how this Zoom thing works. <laughs> Yeah, well, there is one question. Um, so let me go ahead and, and ask it. Uh, it's actually addressed to both of you, and it's about okay. specific court action from last month, um, or actually a decision that the court issued not to act. It was on a, a um, they, they decided not to hear an appeal from a coalition of men who are challenging the uh, male only US military draft registration requirement on the grounds that it amounts to sex-based discrimination. And the court um, decided not to hear that appeal. And Justice uh, Sotomayor issued a statement uh, agreeing with that decision and it was signed uh, also by Justice Kavanaugh and Justice Breyer. Um, and, and the statement cited, you know, the court's longstanding position of deferring to Congress on matters of uh, defense and national security. And, 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 and in this specific question of the draft registration is being actively considered by, by Congress. But, but, but Peter, who's asking this question, says, um, as a veteran, I'm surprised that four justices could not support this case and wonder what both of you think about the court punting to Congress to address uh, what is this uh, a constitutional issue? Um, well, this court, 6-3 uh, conservative court that we've been talking about is um, one of the things that most of the conservatives um, uh, support or they say they are textualists. So they go by the text of any law. Um, Justice Alito isn't quite there, but, but generally they, they are deferential to Congress uh, and they stick to the, li literally the letter of the law, even when there's evidence in the uh, legislative record um, that would allow for some um, uh, uh, flexibility. Um, and that said, there is, um, even as they say that there has been some evidence that they really are, the conservatives are really sort of disdainful of Congress. And, uh, but that said, I think that in this case, this is, uh, those are the cases that they are not going to um, take up. It is, it's quite clear that Congress has um, the power to define that. And um, the last thing, this court is trying to avoid controversies, not um, walk up and, and pick them up, except um, uh, unless you're Justice Alito, Gorsuch, or Clarence Thomas, then you then you would take those on. But even but they are textualists, so in this case they wouldn't take that case. Did you want to add anything, Karen? No. Uh, so here's a question from from Gail, um, specifically about uh, Kavanaugh. So recognizing some of the issues Justice Kavanaugh faced in previous confirmations, uh, why uh, was he put forward? for the Supreme Court as opposed to other conservative candidates? 
And and also Jackie goes into, I mean, the fact that the first time Trump has a chance to, to do it, Kavanaugh's not his guy. And also, of course, in, in very recent days, we've had these revelations, I guess it's in Michael Wolf's book mm -hmm. of Trump just raging against Kavanaugh and saying, the guy wouldn't even get a job at a law firm if it wasn't for me. And, you know, yeah, Michael Wolf put that in his book. As, you, know, you believe it? Well, I, not only do I believe it, but Trump didn't just say that in private. He said it in public. He said it uh, several times at his rallies at the end of his reelection campaign. And more interesting, on January 6th, in his famous remarks to the rally that uh, much many of uh, whose members became insurrectionists, uh, within the hour, they, um, he, you know, we, we most remember now of how he sort of sicked the crowd on Congress and told them he'd march down Pennsylvania Avenue with them and told them, you know, you have to fight. Well, what people don't, um, didn't sort of fix on is that he spent a good number of minutes railing against the Supreme Court too, including Brett Kavanaugh. And as I write in the book that you know, it could just as well, when they got to the Capitol and started rioting, right across the street was the Supreme Court. And, you know, there's just, might have been just as uh, uh, enough of them that had been so whipped up by his complaints about the conservative majority, and in particular, Brett Kavanaugh, because he felt like Brett Kavanaugh owed him because he stuck, like we said, Brett Kavanaugh wouldn't be, wouldn't have been confirmed, but for the fact that Donald Trump stood by him in the face of those sexual assault allegations. So yeah, and why Brett, so the questioner was why Brett Kavanaugh and not someone else? I mean, in, to be fair to Brett Kavanaugh, he is a smart um, ma uh, lawyer who had uh, achieved a lot and he had mentors. One thing he did, he collected mentors. He had Supreme Court, um, just Anthony Kennedy, who pushed him most prominently, including to um, Donald Trump uh, in the Oval Office. He had, um, through the two conservative appeals court judges that he had clerked for, Ken Starr, um, and most George Bush. And of course, George Bush did not recommend, was not something that would recommend him to Donald Trump. So that so there, the sense is, why did he get nominated, given that Trump sort of disdained all things bushy. Um, I think you really have to give credit to Donald Trump's White House counsel, Don McGahn, who is a very conservative, libertarian conservative, and he his pet project is doing away with the administrative state, with federal regulations. And it was Don McGahn, that's why he really put a thumb on the scale for, for Neil Gorsuch to be the first choice for Trump that the, for the, to take the seat that rightfully should have been Merrick Garland's, uh, Obama's nominee. Um, but uh, Brett Kavanaugh likewise had a record on the DC Court of Appeals of ruling against federal regulators. And so was very, very appealing to um, uh, Don McGahn, in fact, it, he chose Kavanaugh to swear him in uh, when he became a commissioner of the Federal Election Commission. Um, so I think Don McGahn had a lot to promoting uh, Brett Kavanaugh to Donald Trump. And in the earlier, I mean, in Bush's years, he, get, he had become a virtual son to George W. Bush. So his being named to the DC Court of Appeals was not a surprise at all back then. Uh, Regina asks whether you think um... Kavanaugh's rulings so far show him to be as conservative as expected. Is, is he proving to be as conservative as, as Thomas Alito and Gorsuch? Absolutely. Um, he is most of the time voting with uh, Thomas Alito and Gorsuch, more often than not. What he does often though, is he doesn't sign on to their opinions usually their dissents, uh, but often the majority opinion as well, he'll write his own. And it, what he's doing is he has this, um, what he, he doesn't like to sign on to their sort of hard right, um, you know, in, in Alito's case, just angry rhetoric. And he, he likes to take a case, 
even though he comes down in the same place, he'll 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 use softer, he'll put a soft glow on it, a, a soft sheen. And for instance, in a case he ruled with, he sided with them against um, gay rights, but he, he opened his, um, his opinion with this pay end to just what great contributors to society gay men and, and women are. And, and, and there was a, some immigration cases where he just was had, you know, waxed eloquent about what a tough time some of these immigrants have and what immigrants have contributed to this country, but he still came down, you know, against the immigrant in the case at hand. More than that. Definitely, I could add, he definitely is on board with um, expanding religious liberties, even at the expense of uh, anti-discrimination laws and with um, gun. He is explicitly calling for the court to expand gun rights. Morton asks, where is the funding coming from uh, for this rightward movement? Well, I mean, I think both there's uh, any number of uh, bottomless pockets out there that are conservatives. This has been true going back through the 20th century where um, very conservative businessmen uh, have who have res uh, you know, especially once after the, uh, the New Deal, uh, just have been putting their money into groups that will promote these um, ideas. And it's, you know, it's dark money for the most part, it's, it's undisclosed. And, um, you know, it's behind groups like the Federalist Society, but I don't really see the Federalist Society as nefarious at all. Um, it's, a, it's a network, it is what it is. It's all, uh, but it's money is, is, I have no idea where the money's coming from. And there, there are other groups that are far more partisan, political and far right and like the Judicial Crisis Network. But all of them, I mean, it's, it's, we don't know where the money's coming from. There are plenty of rich conservatives out there. Uh, RJ, uh says there are many Republicans who blame uh, then Senator Biden for the politicization of the court, uh, pointing to his handling of the Bork hearing. Uh, do you agree with that assessment? Uh, and, and if you don't, if, this, if you think this is a flawed argument, why? Well, no, go ahead. Well, I do think certainly the Bork confirmation was the turning point, but really, uh, and tell me if I'm wrong here, the, the emblematic moment in that was not Jeb Biden, it was Teddy Kennedy. Right, and I think it was what Ted Kennedy did in giving a speech on the Senate floor, like almost as soon as Bork had been nominated by Ronald Reagan, that sort of is why we, the conservatives, to the Republicans and conservative movement to this day are able to say that the Democrats engaged in character assassination of Bork. He gave, is a speech that was subsequently called Ron, um, Robert Bork's America is the title it was given in. And it really was sort of over the top talking about how if in Robert's Bork, Robert Bork's America, you know, you have people um, knocking down your door without a warrant and, and um, it just all the sorts of back alley abortions and things, which frankly, some of it doesn't sound all that far fetched anymore, I have to say, but it, it was over the top and it did, it, a lot of Democrats were chagrined. But I, when it comes to Bork, I go into this at length in the um, in the book because the Bork and Thomas hearings are the two bloody shirts, as I call them, that the conservatives like to wave to this day to justify their own much greater uh, uh, maneuvering skullduggery to get um, their own people on the courts. Um, Bork, frankly, and I think uh, that it's two is a story of two Joe Bidens. On the Bork hearing, Joe Biden, I think was, if you look at the full record of that, ran a hearing and a confirmation that was textbook what you should have if, if, under the Senate's power of advising consent. It was a masterclass in constitutional law. And um, the problem was that Robert Bork, who was there's a reason he was one of Ronald Reagan's last um, Supreme Court nominee. Well, of course, until he had to replace him once Bork was busted by the Senate. It was because he was seen as too extreme. 
not to mention unhealthy and, and older. Republicans like their judges to be young so they can serve for a long time. But, but he, and he, he showed how extreme he was in his responses. He is the last judicial nominee for the Supreme Court who was candid about his views because he was so candid that he turned off a number of Republicans. I mean, people forget that was a bipartisan vote against him. And Ronald Reagan, frankly, did uh, a, a lot of people, including Republicans, blame him for Bork's defeat because he did not fight for Bork. And um, Karen may know more about that since she's written the book on the Reagans, but um, um, but I don't think Nancy Reagan liked Bork all that much. Did she I absolutely her? have no evidence uh, of either way on yeah. that one. But then you go to, uh, and so I think, you know, Bork should arguably was too extreme to be confirmed. It wasn't a big su surprise in the end. And, um, and, and people forget Democrats had taken over the majority. Bork would have been replaced. This is a lot like Kavanaugh. Bork would have been replacing the swing vote on the court. And if there was any, what Reagan, by all everything political, what Howard Baker, his chief of staff in the White House, was arguing that he should name somebody more moderate because you, um, the Democratic majority was not going to replace a swing vote. Um, justice with this extreme conservative. Then just to, to, to on, on the Clarence Thomas hearing was, a, was another matter. If, if as good as um, Joe Biden arguably was in his stewardship of the uh, Bork hearings, he was terrible in the Thomas hearings. And just, it, it was, I, he was so concerned with being seen as fair that he, um, and, and, and all of the senators, especially the Democrats, did not want to be in the middle of this he said, she said fight, unlike anything they had ever taken up. Their own, you know, they all had political reasons to want to avoid this. And so, you know, Biden did not treat Anita Hill well, and he did not, you know, allow some of her witnesses and corroborators to even testify. And so he has been rightfully criticized for that one. Well, there are a couple of questions here about the, the Kavanaugh hearing. Um, one has to do with the whole issue of, uh, of Kavanaugh as the sort of the designated leaker when he worked for Starr. Um, uh, Peter, Peter says the reporter Dan Moldea, who wanted to testify against Kavanaugh, was not called by the Senate Democrats you know, what are your thoughts as to why not? Because, because Dan Muldeo would have testified that Kavanaugh was Starr's designated leaker. Um, it's, it's a very long question where he goes into how, you know, there were, um, there were uh, subpoenas issued uh, for various people on star staff, but Kavanaugh was protected uh, mm -hmm. until the danger had passed and he was never, he was never, Subpoenaed. So um, wasn't that something Peter asked that should have been explored by the Senate Democrats? So that's that's the first question about that. The other question about the hearings were, why do you think the Democrats did or didn't do what they could have um, to, um, to cause Debbie Ramirez to testify? Um, well, first on Dan Day, Dan Day is an investigative reporter and he issued, a, he uh, had a sworn statement again under penalty of perjury in 2018 to the Senate Judiciary Committee about his previous experience with, with um, Brett Kavanaugh during the star years. Um, there was a lot of complaint from the Clinton lawyers that um, Starr's team had been uh, leaking grand jury information, which is you know, not allowed to conservative media. Um, and Dan was, his, his statement went to um, an incident in which he was told by one of the people, one of these more senior lawyers on the Star um, investigation office to that Brett was the man he should talk to. And he did have an off the record meeting with, with Kavanaugh. Um, it, you know, and there was an investigation by a retired judge of the, the question of grand jury leaks. And the problem was it only looked at 
a year when uh, it didn't look at the three years where Kavanaugh had been working for the Star Committee, only came to this at the very end in a, in a period it, that didn't so really apply that Kavanaugh was at work sort of writing the report for Star. And so it, it just didn't even look at the year, the investigation didn't look at the year. So it was far from an exoneration of him, but that was kind of, it was like the Democrats, when they have these confirmation battles, they want to pick their fights. They want to pick the issues. And that just wasn't seen as an issue that was a prominent enough or that would be worth raising. And, um, but as for Debbie Ramirez, um, what, what specifically was the um, viewer's question on her in terms of what, what, what do you think the Democrats college? did or didn't do that it could have yeah. caused Debbie Ramirez to be uh, right that yeah. is um, what a matter I, I think Democrats, there's a good argument that Democrats should have fought harder but Democrats were really powerless this is a Republican run committee and, and Grassley Chairman Chuck Grassley of Iowa was running it um, with a stern hand, but and he had Mitch McConnell behind him, uh, you know, virtually pulling the strings. And so it was not the Republic. There was the Democrats didn't have the votes or ability to force any of these things. But it was such a what was such a travesty. And and Debbie really did think she was going to get called as a witness. But then when they had this sham of an FBI investigation, only in the end because um, there were a couple moderates like um, Susan Collins and Jeff Flake who were not going to vote um, on the um, nomination if unless there was an FBI investigation. Um, the FBI did interview Debbie. And so Republicans said that was enough. But if she had had a public hearing, I I I've talked to her a lot. It she would have been every bit as credible and impressive a witness as Christine Ford was in her turn. And that's what Republicans feared. Uh, well, let me ask uh, this question for Ann, and this will be the last question. Uh, Ann says it's hard not to be completely depressed about all of this, meaning the success that Republicans have had in uh, making the court um, more conservative. Uh, so Anne asks, um, uh, any advice on keeping an even keel despite the way the Supreme Court is ruling? <laughs> Everybody keeps telling me my book is so depressing. And you know, I wish I could give them a happy ending, but <laughs> you know, it is what it is. Um, I think uh, keeping an even keel, I think um, people need to stay engaged. Um, and I think it's the kind of public pressure, I don't know if it's pressure so much, but just making you know, your, your votes um, matter, your being involved that have made this court as conservative as it is, um, uh, cognizant of public opinion and the fact that on many of these issues, whether it's abortion rights, re reproductive rights, uh, gun issues, um, uh, gay rights, that the overwhelming majority of the American people uh, are in a different place than, than the majority of the Supreme Court. But um, so several, you know, certainly Chief, Judge, Chief Justice John Roberts is aware of that and is trying to steer a course that isn't utterly to the right so that there would be an um, uprising. But, you know, the people, you know, one thing I would say is that Progressives um, and you know centrists should should pay as much attention to the courts and judicial nominees as conservatives have been for a half century or more. That'd be my advice. Makes sense. Um, well, we're, we've come to the end of the hour. Uh, great moderating, Karen. Um, Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, and Jackie, uh, your, your book may not may not offer a happy ending uh, to many, but uh, but it does add considerably to our understanding of how Kavanaugh got to where he is and how the court uh, got to be so conservative and the implications of that. Um, so I encourage everyone to um, to get a copy and. Uh, uh, Thank and you, Brad. Read it. <laughs> there it is. And we have signed copies, right? Because you're in the store. Right. Sign them. In my cursive, raised by nuns. It's a nice cursive, so get your own copy. <laughs> uh, to everyone watching, uh, thanks for tuning in. A uh, reminder that in the chat column, 
You can find a link for purchasing copies of Dissent. Uh, from all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well read. <laughs>